Hello, I'm Peter Newman. Bruce, Give why don't you start off and... Okay, yeah. and we flip the coin in back, who goes first, and I lost, so I'm starting. Uh, I'm Bruce Given, uh, you know, uh, by background, I'm an MD. I was an, uh, an academic for a brief period of time, was on the faculty at University of Chicago, and, and uh, decided I liked clinical research better than a bureaucracy, so uh, uh, I've been in industry for about 30 years. Most of it has been developing new drugs, uh, also some work in uh, biologics and uh, diagnostics, uh, devices, a little bit of that, but mostly uh, new drug development. So Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals, uh, to give you a sense about, about us, uh, our lineage actually dates back to about 1995 uh, here in Madison uh, with a company called Miris Bio that spun out of the, uh, the UW. Uh, and they were, they were a gene therapy company. And in the late 90s, only a few years after, after they spun out, um, RNA interference was discovered. It's really a, a young understanding, much like CRISPR is. You know, one of the similarities in our technologies is, you know, the science hasn't even been known very long. And, uh, and the Nobel Prize was awarded uh, in 2006 uh, for RNA interference. But the, uh, you know, the Miris Bio folks got interested in RNAi very early and started thinking about you know, the, the problems of delivering uh, these small RNAs uh, into cells. And, and had an active program going in 1998. They published uh, an article in PNAS that was, was very foundational uh, for, for understanding maybe how people could turn RNAi you know, from a biological phenomenon into a sort of drug therapy approach. And they, um, that got noticed by Roche which had you know, started a very big effort in RNAi, and they, uh, and they bought uh, that part of the Miris business. So they're still a Miris, uh, but, but the, the RNAi part of the business was bought by Roche in 1998. And, uh, and then you know, Roche um, you know, probably spent you know, close to a billion dollars on RNAi, and when they didn't get instant gratification, uh, you know, during one of the, the reorgs that pharma now goes through, you know, every couple of years they reorganize themselves. And in one of the reorgs, they decided, well, we're going to get out of RNAi. And uh, they decided that in about 2010, um, you know, Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals was a small <coughs> company at that point, public. Uh, but we got, a ch we got a shot at that technology and, uh, and, and basically bought it from Roche. And, uh, you know, I led the diligence effort on that. And uh, when, when we took over the Roche assets, you know, which included their site here in Madison, uh, I became the head of R&D and, and manufacturing. Uh, since then, um, you, know, we've, you know, we've had the usual biotech roller coaster, but we're probably now about two and a half to three times bigger uh, than we were at the time that Roche was here. And uh, we have uh, five drugs um, actually in human testing at this point. Uh, we have uh, another a couple that will go into the clinic this year, uh, probably another uh, three or four next year. So, you know, we think we're probably going to be somewhere around 10 uh, drugs in clinical uh, development uh, by the end of next year. So we're actually quite a substantial uh, biotechnology company at this point. Uh, all of those, um, all of those new um, siRNA drugs are created here in Madison. Uh, we're over in the research park. Um, so RNA interference, just real briefly, uh, this is uh, e essentially, uh, as I said, only a, you know, even been known to exist for about 20 years. It's, it's a normal biological process. Um, it's, you know, it uses a machinery that the body mostly uses probably for something called microRNAs, which are a modulatory mechanism uh, for gene expression. Uh, but the, you know, one of the big differences, you know, when we talk about CRISPR, RNAi, et cetera, is, you know, historically drugs, you know, tend to uh, impact proteins. So small molecule drugs are trying to impact proteins. Uh, monoclonal antibodies are trying to impact proteins. Proteins, of course, you know, come from mRNA. mRNA comes from DNA. Um, and we, we work at the RNA level, so before proteins which allows us you know, to very specifically knock down a single RNA and oftentimes a single RNA in a single cell type, which means that we're knocking down a protein in a single cell type. 
The reason that's important and matters is just because many proteins, even though you would like to drug them with small molecules or with monoclonal antibodies, you can't. You know, either because of where they are in the cell or how they interact with other proteins, um, and, and RNAi can, can impact targets that other, you know, other modalities just can't do. Um, and that's, you know, that's what's making it a powerful technology. Peter and I were talking before. Um, I think if you, if you look uh, some years you know, down the road, you know, we're gonna see that a great number of uh, drugs will be, and a great number of targets will be you know, uh, addressed with RNAi. Uh, just like you do with small molecules or, or monoclonal antibodies, RNAi are now going to be a very important modality. Um, and that's in the near future now. The first drug got approved last year. There'll probably be two or three drugs approved this year. Um, you know, five years from now, we'll probably have something like 15 um, RNAi drugs in the market, and it's just going to go from there and expand. So that's really RNAi. That's what we do. Um, stand on the shoulders of Miras Bio and Roche, and, uh, and we're just having more fun than ought to be legal, actually. So, Peter, yeah. I'll turn it over to you. Well, so uh, we hope to be able to maybe do five or ten minutes each, and then uh, it is our great hope that people will find a runner or a mic and uh, ask us uh, questions, things that they're interested in, things that uh, uh, we might stimulate uh, in your brain to stimulate discussion. But I'm going to talk a little bit about CRISPR. Um, and before that, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the difference between uh, uh, CRISPR and, and, uh, and RNAi. So as uh, Dr. Givens said, a lot of drugs target the cell surface, and they target receptors, or sometimes they get into the cell. And what RNAi does, as he just mentioned, is it gets into the cell and binds to RNA. So you know the, the dogma of life is you have DNA about three times 10 to the eighth nucleotides encoding maybe 20,000 or so uh, RNAs and, and those each encode specific proteins. And when you have RNAi, you knock out a specific RNA. What gene editing does is it takes advantage uh, of the ability to cut the DNA at the gene level. And uh, there were some original techniques used for editing genes uh, called talins, and then there were zinc finger nucleases, and these were all uh, proteins that would bind to DNA sequences and then, uh, uh, and then uh, cut the DNA uh, uh, there so you could knock out genes because when a piece of DNA is cut, the cell thinks that's an emergency. Uh, it, it doesn't like that, and so it has a bunch of repairing mechanisms, and it usually adds a few nucleotides and fills it back in really quickly but it does it in an imprecise way, in such a way that the gene will no longer faithfully make a protein because some extra nucleotides got added. And uh, up until uh, this thing called CRISPR, there was no really good faithful way to easily cut the genome exactly where you wanted to cut it and repair it the way you wanted it to be repaired. And the history of CRISPR is really uh, fascinating. There was a guy named Francisco, uh, uh, what's his name here, Francisco Mojica, and he was a graduate student in the mid-90s, and he was walking around the salt mines uh, of southern Spain on the Mediterranean, and his job as a graduate student was to sequence the genome of archaea. I don't know how many of you know archaea, but you know there's bacteria. Archaea are before them, and they've been around for about two billion years. And he started sequencing the genomes of these archaea, and he found that there were a bunch of repeats in their genome and uh, published it in a, an obscure journal. Uh, and then he kept working on these things, uh, just to show you the power of basic science that doesn't really know where it's going. <laughs> and later he found out, uh, several years later, that these sequences weren't actually part of the archaea genome. They were part of bacteriophage, uh, which are viruses that infect the bacteria. And he wondered what the heck a bunch of bacteriophage <laughs> was doing uh, inside of these archaea. And then people started discovering that these sequences uh, were also repeated in some bacteria. And it turns out that it's an ancient immune system uh, discovered uh, by life about two billion years ago where uh, a, uh, an archaea or a bacteria would have an invading piece of DNA from a virus, a bacteriophage that invaded it, and it would chop up the, uh, uh, the genome to protect itself so that it wouldn't just make more viruses. And it took all those little pieces and it put them in its genome in a cluster. And, this, and, the, and the cluster, am I Mike? Okay. Oh, it's gone.
start again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, uh, hopefully you heard some of that. Uh, and so this is sort. Of, and so people started finding, trying to figure out what these what these things were doing, uh, uh, all clustered up like this. And 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 what 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 these guys do is they take these sequences from the bacteriophage, and they hook it up to a nuclease. And now the sequence is the same as the virus. And it, and as the vir the next set of viruses invades the cell, the sequence hybridizes perfectly with the sequence of the virus, and it's attached to a nuclease, which is called Cas9, and it cuts it in just the right place. So just like Orville and Wilbur Wright uh, had to study birds to figure out how to use nature for our own de design, uh, people in the late uh, 1980s and early uh, 2000s started thinking about uh, how we might be able to use a similar gene editing te uh, technique for our own devices. And a woman at Berkeley named Jennifer Dudna and, and folks at MIT uh, started saying, geez, we can use this to edit any genome. You just take any sequence you want, you attach it to these Cas9 nucleases, and you can put it into a cell, and you can cut the genome wherever you want. So if you have your favorite protein that you don't want to work anymore because you want to see what the cell does without it, you just take the sequence for that gene. The genome sequence is done. You attach it to the Cas9 nuclease, so you put it into a cell, and that gene gets inactivated. And so, that, that, so what happens is, in, uh, with RNAi, you're knocking things uh, down. Uh, with CRISPR-Cas9, uh, you're actually knocking out a gene. Uh, the second innovation had to do with the fact that once you've actually cut a gene, uh, if you can get in there as the strands separate with a repair template, with a slightly different sequence in there, not only can you cut it, but you can repair it and change some nucleotides and therefore change some amino acids. And so you can actually modify the sequence of a, of a gene. And uh, it, it, you don't have to use your imagination too much to figure out, geez, that might be good for some mutations that cause cancer or some mutations that cause sickle cell disease or some mutations that might cause hemophilia or any number of, of disorders. Uh, and so uh, the, the field of gene editing, all of a sudden, it, starting in about 2012, uh, and so not that long ago, all of a sudden started to becoming almost as widely a, a, a adopted in the research community and I think in, in biotech uh, as PCR had done uh, 20 or so years uh, before that. Uh, so um, CRISPR gene editing takes advantage of the fact that you can design whatever sequence you want. And it's only about 20 uh, uh, nucleotides and you can make those for about 20 bucks on any machine and you can buy a plasma that encodes Cas9, and you put these things into cells, and you can cut genes with a repair template and change the sequence of the gene. And, and so it's a, a fascinating and really useful uh, technology for research, uh, for developing, being, uh, you can change the genomes of, uh, of fish and bugs and animals and cows and plants, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, so you can improve things. Uh, you can, uh, there's something called gene drive where you can change genes uh, like in mosquitoes and release them into the environment where they're infertile and get rid of those type of things. And of course, a lot of this is, uh, can be used uh, the wrong way and can lead to controversy like any type of, of new technology. Um, and so maybe I'll hand it back to, uh, to Bruce and you can maybe compare and contrast some of the things that, that RNAi can do that, uh, that CRISPR can't and, uh, uh, and some of the applications that you all are using it for. Well, I think as you said, you know, in theory, uh, CRISPR could replace RNAi in the future, um, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, we're, we're knocking down a gene, uh, you know, CRISPR could in theory just knock it out in a cell type of interest. Um, and it could be in, at some point in the future that will happen. I think what people are even more interested in for CRISPR is the ability to, you know, take a, an abnormal gene and make it normal. And uh, so for people with rare genetic disorders, orphan diseases, you know, CRISPR could be a great technology for them in the future because you can make a, a, a you know, basically restore a normal, uh, you know, normal gene function, uh, which is, is, is very intriguing. The, the interesting thing about technologies like RNAi and CRISPR is how hard it is to actually bring them into the human, um, in, into intact humans uh, for treatment. And, and uh, most of these technologies follow something called the Gartner curve, where they start off with incredible hype and interest, you know, and then um, reality sets in. 
and you know everybody hates it, and all the investors you know run for the exits, and the big pharma gets out just like Roche did, and Novartis did, and Merck did with RNAi, and then what's left are the biotechs, the scrappy little biotechs like Arrowhead, and and over time they figure it out, they figure out how to make it work, and it starts to get respect, respect, and before you know it, it's back up here, but it, now it's delivering. So uh, you know that happened, for instance, with with monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and that's happening with RNAi now. RNAi now is really approaching the plateau, I, I would say, of that Gartner curve. So CRISPR is going to have to go through the same thing. Um, right now, it, you know, it's really being hyped. Um, but I think that you know, the, the safety questions of you know, if it gets it right 99% of the time, but it gets it wrong 1% of the time, and you've edited the human genome, you know, you can be. You know, and depending on where you're, you know, where that mistake is happening, you you, know, you could be turning it on an oncogene or something. So, and, and delivery is hard for CRISPR right now in the intact human. So, I think what's going to happen with CRISPR, I think it is up here. I think it is going to go through a, a difficult stage, you know, yet to come. But then I think it will get solved, and I think it will get figured out, and it will, you know, climb back up that curve. So I, I think the initial translation for CRISPR will be probably outside the body. So you know, editing um, white blood cells, lymphocytes outside of the you know the, the body, like we do with CAR T, you know, for cancer, and you know, because then if a mistake is made, it's probably not going to be a permanent mistake, um, and I think we're going to see that. You know, for a while before somebody starts trying to edit a gene in the liver, for instance, where if you make a mistake, you know, you've got a, you know, you, you know, you have an organ that's hard to get to, you have a cancer that you don't know is there, et cetera. So CRISPR is probably going to go through that same Gartner curve, I would predict. You know, I think uh, you know, investment in CRISPR now, um, you know, may may lead to tears uh, in the not so distant future. But then I really do believe they're going to resolve these issues. And, uh, and it will take its place um, uh, alongside monoclonal antibodies, small molecules, and RNAi is a very, very important thing. Uh, there are a lot of people that are worried about, about, of course, eugenics and, you know, people, you know, wanting to edit, you know, somebody's eye color, somebody's hair color, um, you know, maybe even, you know, other things. So, you know, they're also going to really have to figure out the ethics, whereas I think RNAi, you know, is not permanent. And um, you know you you know you could stop at any time, and you know the protein will come back. You know that you're not you're not changing the genome, uh, so it's going to be inherently you know um, considered inherently less you know, you know safer than a permanent change, um, and less you know prone to potential abuse. And uh, I think the scientific community learned a lot with gene therapy, you know, 20 years ago, you know, which also followed the Gartner curve. Um, and is now becoming, you know, a bit more accepted as well. So I would, I would estimate CRISPR will go through that very powerful technique in the lab, um, very powerful, and 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 really um, is is going to be widely used, you know, in the lab for sure. It's going to take longer for humans, I think. Yeah. Um, well, let me just mention. Uh, I think you're right relative to human therapeutics, mm -hmm. but it's become immediately useful. Uh, in research, in generating animal models of disease uh, that you can test therapeutics on, uh, it's been immediately useful in uh, in livestock and plant e engineering, and so uh, I work at a at a place in Milwaukee called the Blood Research Institute, and it's the Blood Research Institute of a of a of a not for profit company called Versity, which also has a series of blood banks and blood centers, and one of the things Versity does is it not only collects blood and and, and hands it out to the community after a lot of testing, but they provide a lot of specialty diagnostics. And uh, as you might guess, when people uh, get blood or bone marrow cells, they have to be matched. And the antigens are sometimes uh, numerous and complex. And uh, uh, alleles and antigens differ from one person to another, often by just a single amino acid in a protein here or there that makes uh, then a different uh, a shape of a protein on the surface that functions, but when given to somebody else can stimulate an immune response. 
Uh, so one of the things that in my laboratory that we're using CRISPR for is we're taking uh, uh, stem cells, uh, e e usually induced pluripotent stem cells, and editing those genes and then differentiating them into red cells or white cells or platelets. Uh, and uh, before we differentiate them, we, we grow these iPL cells up. We edit their genes so that we can make banks of patient-matched uh, cells, which are immediately useful for diagnostics. And you can make rare antigens and rare blood types uh, that are really unavailable in the human population that are immediately useful for diagnostics. And so if we happen to edit some other gene, uh, we don't care. We just want a cell that has the right type of patient-matched antigens on their surface. And so that, that's a... Uh, uh, an immediate application, and folks are uh, using them in very clever ways. You know, uh, uh, one example uh, is uh, you want to use organs uh, for a transplant, and there aren't enough human organs available. And so people have been trying to use um, organs from related animals, like pigs. But pigs happen to have in their genome a whole bunch of retroviruses that can come out uh, when they're stressed and cause a problem. And so there are folks that have gone into the, the, the pig genome and inactivated with CRISPR, all 57 retroviruses, and now the organs are, are safe. So people are starting to use gene editing in very clever uh, uh, ways. I mean, there, there, are, there are, you know, outlandish things, like you say, change eye color. I don't think anybody's really interested in that. But there are people interested in, in finding out how you might be able to turn an elephant back into a mammoth. So, uh, <laughs> and that, that could be kind of interesting, too. Uh, you know, we only have a, a limited amount of time up here, um, so uh, I think both of us, we can't see you all that well, uh, would enjoy uh, any comments or questions that you have about the technology or its uses or where it's going or how, you know, you might be thinking of it. So uh, if you'd like, raise your hand or go find a microphone. Are there runners out there to run mics to people? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's, oh that's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, and use a mic. Yeah. Uh, thank you both very much for the discussion. Um, I guess this question is probably more for Peter in the discussion about ethics relating to CRISPR. In your role as a, a director of research at an organization, where do those discussions of ethics occur? How do you, in your role, um, envision your organization participating in those discussions versus just reacting to kind of the findings of those those ethical uh, debates and outcomes. Yeah, well, at, at my particular organization, we're not trying to edit the human genome in humans. And so we have no uh, ability to do long-term effects. But, but there are uh, 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 clinical trials going on at universities, and there are more than a dozen companies now using CRISPR. And I think, you know, ethics has to take place outside the scientific community, involve scientists to get uh, a, a good discussion but uh, uh, the, the ethics of it relative to what we do uh, isn't an issue because we're taking cells outside the body and trying to make diagnostic, but, but in the future, therapeutic reagents. And I think w with CRISPR, as Bruce was saying, um, you, you make this uh, 17 nucleotide uh, 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 guide that's gonna take the nuclease and cut a gene. Uh, uh, mathematically, a sequence of 17 uh, uh, nucleotides should only occur once in the genome if the genome were random, which it isn't. And, and so the off-target effects, I think, for both of these technologies can be a concern. In early days of gene therapy, like, like Bruce was saying, people started to uh, uh, modify genes and they'd, they'd find out that somewhere else far away in the genome, something else got altered and it turned on a cancer gene and there were people who got leukemias as a result of the gene therapy. So the the risk to benefit ratio, uh, I think, for, for any of these type of technologies, whether it be RNAi or CRISPR or gene therapy or immunotherapy, is something that you have to gauge relative to the, uh, the safety of the technique and the severity of the disease. If something's going to be fatal at the age of eight, you're probably going to take a little bit more risk than something uh, that might be convenient to, to fix. Uh, and uh, so I think th those are some of the discussions. The, at a molecular biology level, folks are trying to devise ways to rapidly go through the genome and make sure nothing else got altered. So if I was going to take a bone marrow stem cell out of somebody with sickle cell disease and fix one amino acid that's wrong, uh, it'd be good to take that cell out, expand it in culture, and do a genome, a very thorough genome screen. And there are very 
cool computational methods now uh, uh, to make sure that nothing else got altered. Or you have 100 cells that you've altered and you find out that these 10 didn't get altered and then expand those and put those back in. So, you know, the, the, the scientists, you know, first do no harm, right? Scientists in medicine, and we're trying to be very careful about it and then go about it by just gauging the risk to benefit uh, ratio. Um, but the, the, the ethics, you know, these things, all these treatments have to go through institutional review boards. They're made up of, of lay people, uh, people from all walks of life, and they ask all, all these very types of hard questions which all have to be uh, answered carefully before they're implemented as therapeutics. Yeah, and I would say, you know, my comments about worrying about eugenics, for instance, I'm not really worried in the U.S., you know, because we've really been thinking about this hard for the last 25, 30 years, really when we, when we began to be able to, you know, uh, reasonably uh, sequence the genome and, and truly understand uh, genetics better, you know, people immediately started worrying about this, thinking about this. I'm a little more concerned, you know, about outside the U.S. where, you know, Europe is fine, of course, but, but you know, you get to Asia, for instance, and, and you know, they're, they're not as systematic and careful in some places about some of these things. And that's where I worry a little more about, you know, uh, uh, the lack of control in, 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 you know, sort of the bioethics piece of this. It, Just to be clear, I'm not, I'm not talking about the U.S. Well, and, and in fact, most traits are, are influenced by about a thousand genes. And so the ability to do something like that is really almost impossible. On the other hand, you can do with all good intentions to try and cure uh, a gene defect and inadvertently make a mistake somewhere else. And that's where I think the ethics and the oversight has to happen. Other questions? Yep. There's a, a mic running your way. Uh, hi, thanks for the uh, great talk. Uh, we are a gene editing company based in Boston, and last year we uh, we made almost 2,000 uh, mice and rat uh, uh, models using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And uh, many pharma companies, every single biggest research uh, uh, university, including uh, University of Ma uh, Wisconsin Madison, they are our clients. And uh, one of uh, uh, the biggest question that everyone asks, and uh, almost every single client, is about the IP issues. That is, uh, b and because uh, uh, b uh, because of the ongoing legal uh, battle between MIT and you know uh, c California. So, uh, what your thoughts are on that? <laughs> You have a, I have a thought, but go ahead. No, you, why don't you? So, so the, the, <laughs> the question is that uh, there, the people out in Berkeley and folks at MIT, Dr. Zhang, both filed patents on the use of the technology uh, to edit human genes. Because, like I said, Dr. Mojica uh, was looking at, at archaea. But now the application of this to humans is something that it, it has been uh, patented by a couple institutions. Um, and so, the, you know, the purpose of a patent is, is to, to prohibit anybody from making, using, or selling something without a license. And I think what that means is just like PCR, you know, they could have prohibited its use. But if you're in it for the right reason, you patent something, and it's, a, it's an agreement with a government to say, if, if, if we give you patent protection, you'll make it publicly available. And that's supposed to be the goal. And so if you, if you make these animals and then approach these companies and, and obtain a license, it'll add something to the cost of a drug or a therapeutic or a diagnostic cell or a, or a mouse. Uh, but I think all these people who've, who've patented these things and make them want to see them get put into widespread use. And so I'd say that the impact is probably going to be economic and that there's going to be a licensing fee attached to the actual mouse that you uh, may that you're just going to have to add to it, and we'll have to do the same thing with some of the cells. We've made mice uh, too. If you're just using them for research use, these companies usually don't care. As soon as you commercialize it, and there seems to be money at the end of it, uh, th then then you get a letter, uh, and then you just go through all the channels, which take months and months through the lawyers, and, and obtain a license so that you can make these things available. So uh, I guess that other other thoughts. Well said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could talk. Uh, you mentioned some challenges related to delivery um, of these these therapeutics uh, potentially to humans and how they might be different from each other and uh, that sort of thing. I think Bruce has thought a lot about that. 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, delivery is, is important. And, uh, you know, for RNAI, uh, you know, that, you know, really was the dominant theme uh, or one of the dominant themes in the first decade. And, and <coughs> delivery challenges had a lot to do with the sort of fall in the, the Gartner curve. You know, that and probably stimulating the innate immune system. And it took about a decade to figure out how to get around that. So, you know, the leaders in RNAi now, um, of which there, are, you know, are really two, arguably three, of which we're one of them, uh, you know, are using a direct conjugation approach now. So, no nanoparticles. We, uh, you know, we conjugate the double-stranded RNA directly to a ligand that is targeting an internal recept, you know, internalizing receptor. Um, and, and what that gives us is a lot of specificity uh, to cell type. Um, so, you know, we're not delivering to cell types we don't want to deliver to, uh, which is really helpful. And by avoiding nanoparticles, you know, nanoparticles look a lot, you know, to the, you know, the, the human uh, immune system like, uh, like viruses and, and fungi, and they don't like them. Uh, so, you know, all these complex liposomal systems and things that are very common in, in academia. Academia is discovering new nanoparticles all the time, but they're usually not a, a great thing to do in, in human, you know, uh, disease treatment. So the challenge right now for CRISPR is how to deliver CRISPR. And, and you know, my understanding is most of what people are thinking of at this point is probably viral, is. viral delivery systems. And of course, the problem with virus, you can only deliver it once. So if it doesn't work the first time, you, you, you probably can't do it again with that virus at least because you get immunity to it. And then payload side, right? right you know, how much you can package inside that, inside that virus is the, is the other big challenge so far that I understand. But with gene therapy, of course, the size of the gene mattered. Absolutely. With CRISPR, it's the same enzyme. It's Cas9. It's in a plasmid. You put in a small guide RNA, and you usually put these things inside the genome of a, a lentivirus or something, and you can deliver it just like any type of, of gene therapy. But, you know, getting a, a, it into a cell that's accessible is a big deal. So if you have to get it into the middle of the, of the liver, it's a little bit tougher than getting it into the bone marrow where everything's percolating around uh, all the time anyway. So it, it, the target will make a difference. Yeah, so I do think, yeah. you know, the... the you know, I am not a CRISPR ex expert, but from the outside looking in, I, I think CRISPR's two big challenges are, you know, getting, uh, getting it delivered, you know, to the right place, um, and, uh, you know, as you said, you know, diffusely in a tissue, which is normally what you're going to want to do. Uh, one, you know, two, you know, having absolute fidelity, you know, is, is, you know, the other big piece, I think, of CRISPR. And I think those are the two things that are going to really, and then the regulatory challenges that come along with those, yeah. of which they are significant. I think we only have another couple of minutes, so we can take one last question. Anybody else out there have something they want to discuss or ask about? All right, I think we're supposed to end it about five or ten after. I do have one disclosure that I don't think I've told you about. Um, I've been commissioned... Uh, by KFC to edit the chicken genome <laughs> because they want something CRISPR. So, uh, <laughs> thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah.